Okay, we're good to go. All right, good evening and welcome to Lighthouse Bible Church, whether you're in person or on Facebook. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up two verses in chapter 10 tonight and then get into chapter 11. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, we just love you. We praise you. We just thank you for being the awesome, incredible, loving God that you are. We thank you for the way you just pour your blessings out on us. Father, as we study your, your word tonight, I just pray that our spiritual eyes and ears will be open to the truth of your word, that I'll say nothing that contradicts your word and nothing that interferes with the message you want delivered tonight. I pray, Father, that uh, your blessing upon us uh, as we study your word. Uh, uh, I just pray that uh, everything that we say and uh, do is glorifying and honoring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, Last week, we almost, well, we actually we got through chapter 10, but uh, I want to take a look, a closer look at the last two verses of chapter 10 before we continue in 11. So reading uh, verses 20 and 21 of uh, Daniel 10. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Persia will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So the, Daniel, the, the angel asked Daniel if he knows why he has come to him, which seems like a rather unusual question in view of, of uh, verses 12 and 14 in which the angel states his purpose for coming to Daniel. So why did the angel ask Daniel this question in verse 20? <laughs> Maybe he was testing him. To see <laughs> kind of sort of. Paying attention, Daniel? Kind of sort of. I think the question really is very likely meant to call Daniel's attention to what has been said. Keep in mind, Daniel's in his 80s. Mm -hmm. And in, in verse uh, 17, Daniel said, as for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Mm -hmm. I mean, Daniel is at the point of, I think, physical and emotional exhaustion mm -hmm. because of what he has seen here. And to me, this is the angel saying, okay, Daniel, pay attention to me. Are you tracking with me? Are you getting all this? Mm -hmm. That's what I see him saying with that question. Mm -hmm. And the angel then tells Daniel that he must return to fight with the prince of Persia. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, this is that invisible spiritual war that we looked at last week mm -hmm. and would continue for over 200 more years mm -hmm. uh, until the Persians were defeated by Alexander the Great in 331 B.C. That means that this spiritual warfare took place during the time of Esther. Mm -hmm. People tend to overlook that, but it isn't at all unreasonable to conclude that this demonic Prince of Persia played a significant role in the events that are recorded in Esther. Remember that during those days, the Jews were in danger of total annihilation yeah. because of the decree of the king. Mm -hmm. And also remember when we were in uh, Nehemiah, the opposition that he faced. Mm -hmm. Same situation, spiritual warfare that's going on there. Then the angel tells Daniel that the Prince of Greece will come. And, of course, the Greek Empire, we know, followed Persia in 331 B.C. And just as with the Persian Empire, uh, the Greek Empire would be uh, affected by this invisible spiritual warfare. Same thing. Now, as fascinating as the spiritual warfare over earthly empires was, uh, the angel directs Daniel's attention to the more important word of God in verse 21. And he makes a very interesting statement. Yeah. Uh, so he says, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Now it's a parenthetical statement, yeah. but what meaning do you get from that statement? Why would Michael hold him up? I, I, I kind of... Well, he says, no one upholds, oh, oh, me, upholds me yeah, except Michael, your prince. So what's he saying there? Michael's in charge. Michael's in charge, but he's also saying that Michael is the only one that supported him. Okay? Now, at first glance you say, wow, nobody else wanted to come? Wow. 
If you got Michael and you got Gabriel, the only one better is Jesus. You don't need anybody else <laughs> besides Michael and Gabriel. That's true. That's the yeah. meaning that I get from that. So now, according to Bible scholars and, and prophecy experts and people who count such things, uh, chapter 11 contains some 135 fulfilled prophecies. 135. I did not go through and count them. I just took the word of common. <laughs> just so you know. But it's no wonder then. Hi, Brother Cecil. How are you? <laughs> it's no wonder then that skeptics and unbelievers doubt and try to disprove the authenticity of the book of Daniel. You know, otherwise, they have no excuse for rejecting the only God who is all-knowing mm -hmm. and is in total control of the history of the world. That's right. Amen. You know, if they accepted Daniel as the scripture of truth, as verse 21 says, then they'd be forced to accept the truth of God's own words in the book of Isaiah. And where uh, he says that he is the only God who can foretell the future, mm -hmm. He's also the only God who can provide salvation for this lost and dying world. Right. Listen to the words of Isaiah uh, 44, verses 6 and 7. Uh, the words of the Lord written in Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. And then in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. The angel tells Daniel that he isn't going to hear anything or see anything that is contradictory to the Word of God. That's right. You know, and as Paul tells us in Ephesians and the writer of Hebrews, who personally I think it was Paul, uh, he says the Bible, the sword of God, is the best weapon we have in our spiritual warfare. Yes. Sadly, we leave it in its scabbard much too often. Mm -hmm. We don't take it out and use it. This is our sword, That's right. sword of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So now we come to the two parts of the vision. The, uh, the I'm not sure if this is correct to say this way, but it just sounded good. The historically prophetic. Uh, it was prophecy when it was given, but it is now historic mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it's been fulfilled. And then we have the prophetical, mm -hmm. which is yet to be fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, now, this is, this is really going to be a history lesson uh, tonight, and uh, uh, I hope that I haven't gotten down in the weeds too much with some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you. But chapters 10 and 12, through 12, as I said, all deal with the same vision. Uh, I think chapter 11 is probably the most important chapter of the three uh, because it fills in details. Some of the details of the 70 weeks of Daniel uh, it also fills in some of the details of the last three of the four nations symbolized in that multi-metallic image uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's back in chapter 2, and then the beasts of chapter 7 that we looked at. This chapter, it also <coughs> provides us a prophetical bridge for part of the time gap between the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, you know, that period between the Old and New Testaments was a time, I think, through history of, of Israel's greatest trials that they ever went through uh, at the hands of both Syria and Egypt. And that's what we're going to see tonight uh, as we go through these verses. Because it was during this period that Antiochus Epiphanes, yeah. whom we have studied and we're going to study again in the latter half of this chapter, uh, who is also a picture of the Antichrist mm -hmm. who is to come, uh, he was in power. And he was a member of the Seleucid, or some people say Seleucid, uh, family. And we'll identify him when he come to this chapter, come to him in this chapter, actually down in uh, verse 21. Now, he persecuted the Jews, as we saw, far beyond anything 
that Pharaoh or Hitler had done, mm -hmm. but what he did will pale by comparison to what the coming beast or the Antichrist of the Revelation will do yeah. to the Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, you think, just when it can't get any worse? Yeah. Boy, yeah. does it ever. Does it ever. <laughs> yeah. Now, this, this prophecy also bridges the gap from Media Persia to Greece and from Asia to Europe. Uh, it tells of the transition of world powers from one continent to another, uh, from the east to the west. And we need to keep in mind that this prophecy concerns the people of Daniel, the Israelites. That's who it's all about. Yeah. That's what it's all about. So let's read the first two verses of chapter 11. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So again, we're not told the name of the angel doing the speaking here, but I personally am convinced that it's Gabriel. And uh, he says that he confirmed and strengthened someone. Who did he confirm and strengthen? Daniel. Daniel, who else? Oh, Darius. Darius, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Not a trick question. Yeah. Remember, this occurred during the reign of Darius the Mede. Uh, and that when Daniel was thrown into the lion's mm -hmm. den. And Darius, if you recall, he wanted to deliver Daniel from the lion, but he was trapped by his own decree. He had all, he'd been tricked into saying, hey, throw him in the lion's den. He couldn't change that. But remember what he said in chapter 6, verse 16 to Daniel. Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now Gabriel is saying, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Darius, he did. And Gabriel confirmed and strengthened Darius in his faith. He also comforted and assisted Daniel, uh, which we can see from what Daniel said in uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 22. It's what he said to Darius. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Remember when Daniel went to the lion's den, the first thing he did, he called out to Daniel. He would make sure he was still alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but Gabriel strengthened him. Now, verses 3 through 34, one of the most remarkable examples of pre-written history, what we call prophecy, because they were prophetic at the time. Mm -hmm. This is the section of the book that, uh, of Daniel that causes people so much irritant, uh, causes them to doubt uh, Daniel's authorship of the book. And here's where we're going to see clear-cut statements of prophecy that have been literally fulfilled. The problem that the doubters have with this chapter is that it is so detailed and it's so accurate, they can't accept the fact that it was written beforehand. <laughs> you know, they say, nobody knows that. They're right, God knew it. Right. He's the one that had it written. That's all that counts. Know? That's right. And you know, the angel tells Daniel in verse two, that there would be four notable kings of Persia to follow Cyrus. Mm -hmm. Secular history has identified these uh, four as Cambyses in 529 BC, mm -hmm. Pseudo Smerdis in 522 BC, Darius Hystaspis, 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 you say it three times, uh, in 521 BC, and then Xerxes, who invaded Greece in 480 BC and was defeated. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Medo-Persia, they never, ever once again tried for world domination. Right. Just didn't happen. So, moving on, verses 3 and 4. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. But not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion, with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. This mighty king is Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. who came to power in 335 BC over the Greco-Macedonian Empire when he conquered Persia and the known world at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Alexander the Great, as I said when we studied him, he was probably the greatest military strategist the world had ever seen. Mm -hmm. Died as an alcoholic when he was 32 years of age. Christ. You know, wow. You know, 
Now, his empire, when he died, was then divided into four geographical areas that we studied back in chapter 7. But just by way of review, these four areas were Macedonia, ruled by Cassandra, mm -hmm. Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, ruled by uh, Lysimachus, Syria, and the remainder of the Middle East that was ruled by Samoitus Nicator, and then Egypt, ruled by Ptolemy. These four families fought among themselves mm -hmm. continually. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they all lost their kingdoms when the Romans marched east. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to get into mm -hmm. now. So verses 5 through 9. Mm -hmm. Also, the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes. And he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years, they shall join forces. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her, of her authority. And neither he nor his power, wait a minute, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. But from a branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold. And he shall continue more than the king of the north. Also, the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Huge amount of history here. Mm, yeah. Huge amount. This begins a, a detailed prophecy of then future conflicts that would develop between two divisions of Alexander's empire, the descendants of Ptolemy I in Egypt mm -hmm. uh, and those of Seleucus I in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ptolemies are referred to as the king of the south, okay? And the Seleucids mm -hmm. as the king of the north. That's because of mm -hmm. their geographic relationship to Israel. And it's always important to remember that when you're talking about north, south, east, or west of somewhere, yeah. In scripture, it's Israel. That's right. And when you're going to Israel and specifically Jerusalem, it matters not where in the world you are, you're going up to Jerusalem. Yeah. You're never, ever going down or over to Jerusalem. You're always going up to Jerusalem. That's awesome. That's that, you know, Jerusalem is God's city. Yeah. You know? So you go it is up. Right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the conflicts of Syria and Egypt are outlined because of their impact on uh, Israel, which was located between the two of them. One was north and one was south. The king of the north, Syria, ruled by Seleucus, became stronger than the king of the south, Egypt, ruled by Ptolemy. Uh, each line of power continued through many successors, but here we have only the most important ones mentioned in this prophecy. Now. Although a number of generations are ignored, the, ma the major developments and trends are clearly outlined here. Secular history fills in a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and it, it matches up perfectly with this. Mm -hmm. So verse 6 says that the daughter of the king of the south will try to make an agreement with the king of the north, and that brings us to about 250 B.C. Now historians differ on some of the minor details, but they recorded some of the manipulations that went on in that day which fulfilled this prophecy very accurately and i got to tell you this story is better than any soap opera that's ever been on tv <laughs> or ever will be on tv you know so in an attempt to form an alliance mm -hmm. between these two families who had been at war with each other for years okay ptolemy philadelphus of egypt gave his daughter berenice in marriage to Antiochus Theos of Syria. Now that's kind of like a marriage between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Yeah. <laughs> no, really, that, that's, that's what that's like. However, there was a fly in the ointment. Antiochus was already married to Laodice, so he divorced her, okay? Two years later, Ptolemy Philadelphus died. So Antiochus Theos, he divorced Berenice and took back his first wife, Laodice. 
not real smart because she poisoned Antiochus Theos <laughs> and then ordered the death of Bernice and her son and then put her own son, Seleucus Callinicus, on the throne. Um, I told you, you can't make this up. No Hollywood couldn't write something this good. That was some juggling act, but it's interesting how all of this is covered in the prophecy given wow. to Daniel in verses 5 and 6. Wow. Right there. And then verse 7 says that a branch of her roots will do battle with and defeat the king of the north. That's a reference to Bernice's royal line, specifically her brother, Ptolemy III Eugetes. He replaced his father, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, and presumably as an act of revenge, attacked and conquered the king of the north, Syria, in a war which lasted from 241, 246 to 241 BC. It was during this war that Ptolemy occupied Antioch, which at the time was the capital of the Seleucid kingdom, he even got into Babylon. Now, in exchange for peace in 241 BC, Ptolemy was uh, given new territories on the northern coast of Syria, which included the port of Antioch. At this time, the Ptolemaic kingdom was at the height of its power right now. So secular history records that Ptolemy Eugates took e into Egypt spoils of war that included 4,000 talents of gold and 40,000 talents of silver, which today would be worth about $165 million, uh, along with 2,500 idols. And interestingly enough, we can look at verse 8 and read the prophecy about that king of the south carrying their gods and precious articles of silver and gold into Egypt. Ain't it interesting how secular history yeah. confirms yeah. Scripture? It's awesome. We don't need it to do it because we know yeah. that it's already God's truth. Amen. Now, verse 9 is a reference to Seleucus II Callinicus, uh, who invaded Egypt, attacked the king of the south, Egypt, uh, in 240 B.C. He was uh, forced to retreat and return to his own land because he was just soundly whooped when he got down there. And uh, as prophesied in the following passages, however, his sons proved to be a bit more successful mm -hmm. in their conflicts with Egypt. So verses 10 through 14 of chapter 11. However, his sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage, and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. Hmm. There was continual warfare yeah. between Egypt and Syria during the intertestamental period when Israel seemed to just repeatedly make the wrong choice mm. and was taken captive first by one and then by the other. Mm. Uh, the Jews just experienced untold su suffering from both the king of the north, Syria, and the king of the south, uh, Egypt, and just literally thousands upon thousands of them were killed during this time. The fulfillment of these predictions not only prove that God is able to anticipate history by hundreds of years, but he's also able to set the stage for events in Israel. Mm. All done behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's played out just as he planned it. Mm. It's the primary reason for this revelation to Daniel. Yeah. You know, people just lose track of what an awesome God that yeah, we serve. That's so true. You know, yeah. we, we read this and it's history. It, this was presented to Daniel. These nations didn't even exist at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And Daniel said, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So, verses 15 to 17. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound 
and take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. Mm. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. Mm -hmm. That statement, he shall stand in the glorious land, mm -hmm. is just another statement of why this has been recorded and give to Dan, given to Daniel. It concerns the glorious land. Yeah. What's the glorious land? Israel. Israel and Jerusalem, the land that God promised to Abraham and to those coming after him time and time again. Verses 15 and 16 predict what secular history now records as the victory of Antiochus the Great mm -hmm. over Egypt. Uh, this victory resulted in the Syrian occupation of Israel as far south as Gaza, brought immeasurable suffering to Israel. These verses actually cover a period of about 125 years, uh, and they were fulfilled in detail just as prophesied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so verse 17 actually brings us to about 198 or 195 B.C. when Antiochus the Great finally made a treaty with Egypt. Uh, apparently, uh, it's thought that he felt the growing threat of Rome and he tried to negotiate peace with Egypt by offering his daughter, Cleopatra I Cyrus, not the same Cleopatra associated with Julius Caesar, uh, to Ptolemy V Epiphanes, in 192 BC, old Antiochus hoped that his daughter would remain loyal to him, uh, be a strong advocate for Syria, which would give him control over Egypt. But as it says in scripture, and as it turned out in history, she didn't do that. <laughs> she consistently sided with her husband Ptolemy and against her father Antiochus. So, as we read on, we'll see what happens to him. Verses 18 and 19. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. He shall turn his face to the coastlands or the Isles. That's a reference to Greece and all of the Greek islands, uh, which is where Antiochus the Great was beginning to make his move uh, at this time. Mm -hmm. Not only against Ptolemy in the south, but against Lysim Lysimachus uh, there in the west. Now he did experience some initial successes, uh, but this would prove to be a serious mistake on his part because this is where Rome <coughs> was also beginning to flex its muscles. Yeah. And uh, so the Roman commander, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, uh, was sent against uh, Antiochus the Great, forced him to withdraw and take refuge in Asia Minor. Then fighting with their Greek allies, the Romans, they literally crushed the Syrians. Mm -hmm. uh, 30,000 Roman troops pursued Antiochus into Asia and defeated his army of 70,000 at what was known as the Battle of Magnesia. Uh, that was near Smyrna, which is Turkey today. That was in 190 B.C. Then in 188 B.C., uh, the Romans forced Antiochus to sign the Treaty of Apamea. And listen to what it stipulated. This is a quote from the treaty. For the future, he keeps no elephants and pays for the cost of the present war incurred on his account. 500 euboic talents down and 2,500 more when the Senate ratifies the treaty, and 12,000 more during 12 years, each yearly installment to be delivered in Rome. He shall also surrender to us all prisoners and deserters, and to Eumenes whatever remains of the possessions he acquired by his agreement with Italus, the father of Eumenes. If Antiochus accepts these conditions without guile, we will grant him peace and friendship subject to the Senate's ratification. Hmm. Well, Antiochus accepted that. He signed the treaty. And he could have gone down in history as you know, one of the great conquerors of the ancient world. 
if he had just been content to leave Greece alone. Mm -hmm. you know, but he, like all rulers, he got greedy mm -hmm. and he went into Greece. <coughs> and so he fulfilled this prophecy of verse 19 mm -hmm. by returning to his own land, mm -hmm. humiliated, broken, and mm -hmm. defeated. Mm -hmm. Well, he needed funds to pay the tribute demanded by the Romans. So what does he do? He decides that he's going to rob the temple at uh, Elimaeus, where he was murdered in 187 BC by those guarding the sanctuary of the temple, wow. uh, Jupiter there. Now, you say, well, what's all this have to do uh, with the history of Israel? Well, it's important because Antiochus the Great was followed by Seleucus the Fourth uh, Philopater, who in turn was succeeded by Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, mm -hmm. who is described in detail in verses 21 to 35. Yeah. So now, our final verse tonight is verse 20. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Hmm. Now because of the treaty of Athamia, signed by his predecessor Antiochus, Seleucus Philopater, uh, was forced to pay tribute or taxes to the Romans uh, of a thousand talents annually. A lot of money. In order to raise this uh, amount of money, he had to tax all the land in his kingdom, and he put special taxes on the Jews, uh, which was collected by a tax collector, collector by the name of Heliodorus. Mm. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read you a portion out of 2 Maccabees. Now, it's important because this it's an incredible story about Heliodorus' attempts to steal money from the Jewish temple. Mm. Now, you have to keep in mind that the books of Maccabee, Maccabees mm -hmm. are not considered to be divinely right. inspired mm -hmm. scripture. Okay? Uh, and there's no other records of these truly incredible events to substantiate their authenticity. But I gotta tell you, it is a story that will knock your socks off. So I'm just gonna read this to you. While they, uh, Jews distraught that Heliodorus was attempting to take funds from God's house, were imploring the Almighty Lord to keep the deposit safe and secure for those who had placed them in trust, Heliodorus went on with his plan. But just as he was approaching the treasury with his bodyguards, the Lord of Spirits, who holds all power, manifested himself in so striking a way that those who had been bold enough to follow Heliodorus were panic-stricken at God's power and fainted away in terror. There appeared to them a richly caparisoned horse mounted by a dreadful rider. Charging furiously, the horse attacked Heliodorus with its front hooves, the rider was seen to be wearing golden armor. Then two other young men, remarkably strong, strikingly beautiful, and splendidly attired, appeared before him. Standing on each side of him, they flogged him unceasingly until they had given him innumerable blows. Suddenly he fell to the ground, enveloped in great darkness. Men picked him up and laid him on a stretcher. The man who a moment before had entered that treasury with a great retinue and his whole bodyguard was carried away helpless, having clearly experienced the sovereign power of God. While he lay speechless and deprived of all hope of aid due to an act of God's power, the Jews praised the Lord, who had marvelously glorified his holy place, and the temple, charged so shortly before with fear and commotion, was, fear, was filled with joy and gladness, now that the Almighty Lord had manifested himself. Mm -hmm. Soon some of the companions of Heliodorus begged Onias to invoke the Most High, praying that the life of the man who was about to expire might be spared, fearing that the king might think that Heliodorus had suffered some foul play at the hands of the Jews, the high priest offered a sacrifice for the man's recovery. While the high priest was offering the sacrifice of atonement, the same young men in the same clothing again appeared and stood before Heliodorus. <laughs> Be very grateful to the high priest Onias, they said to him. It is for his sake that the Lord has spared your life, since you have been scourged by heaven.
proclaim to all men the majesty of God's power. When they had said this, they disappeared. After Heliodorus had offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made most solemn vows to him who had spared his life, he bade Onias farewell and returned with his soldiers to the king. Mm. Wow. Now, what a story. Yeah. What a wow. story. Mm. You know, it, it just shows to go you. You don't mess with God's people. You don't <laughs> mess with God's temple. Yeah. And you read prophecy and you think, well, what's the Old Testament got to offer? Better, better than anything you're going to see on TV yeah. when you look at it <laughs> and you research it. Wow. I mean, this is just exciting yeah. stuff here yeah. Yeah. that we can read. Yeah. And as, as I was looking at this and I thought, wow, you know, here's Daniel, a man in his 80s. It's easy to understand why he was at the point of emotional and physical mm -hmm. exhaustion. Can, it, I can't even begin to imagine mm. having a vision like this presented to me and I'm sitting there, none of these nations exist. This is hundreds of years in the future. And Gabriel is saying, Daniel, watch this TV, boy. You're gonna see something <laughs> exciting. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see something exciting. Yeah. And you know, this has all been fulfilled. Yeah. And we're gonna see a little bit more that's been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna pick up with uh, verse 21 next week because that's where we pick up with the guy we've talked about before, Antiochus Epiphanes, yeah. and the things that he's going to do, and we're going to talk more about the 70 weeks, and and we're, we're getting down near the end now mm -hmm. uh, of the book of Daniel. But it, you know, it closes out on a bang. People tend to look at, at chapter 9 of Daniel and ignore everything else, but I'm telling you, mm -hmm. keep on going and go all the way through yeah. the 12 chapters, because those last three, it, it, there just isn't much more exciting reading in Scripture it's than true. what you will read in chapter 3, historically and prophetically. Yeah, all the world's events. All the world's right events. Absolutely. Yeah. The history of the world Incredible. in three chapters. Mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, yeah, just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you all. Oh, thank thank you, you, Pastor. That was up. great. Awesome. Father, again, thank you for this word. Thank you for just the exciting things we see in your word. And Father, as we leave here, I just pray that you'll continue watching over us. Keep us safe. <clears throat> we look forward to uh, uh, our world returning to what we knew as normal. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we accept what you know as normal. That's right. And uh, we just want what you want for us, Father. Uh, just want to continue to hold our pastor up. Uh, keep him safe, Father, in good health. Uh, give him insight and wisdom into your word this week as he prepares your message for Sunday. And we just look forward to really a great crowd of people here Sunday morning. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.